So our session is about shifting from subject-centered to student-centered education. And I wanted to um, take a moment just to talk about how we know that every student deserves a highly effective, engaging, and equitable education. And from the session before, I would add everything in there that they said to critical thinking, empathetic. Those are the things that we really need to um, reach their full potential. And I want to talk a little bit about my work in open educational resources. But I want to just set up sort of, my talk is going to sort of set up the panel, the rest of the speakers, as well as tell you a little bit more about my work. So as we move from the subject centered to a student centered um, mode of education, you know, I think again, we've already heard so much of this in the last two days, but we're moving from subject based to interdisciplinary, a standardized teaching to competency based learning. And I'll give just a couple of quick examples about each of these. Um, you know, one size fits all to personalized learning and proprietary curriculum to open educational resources. You heard this morning somebody talk from Austria about that example too. So competency-based education uh, is uh, probably the best living example of this is what we see in Finland today. But this is, this is something that's really growing uh, in the United States but in other countries as well where we're really focusing on what is the outcome and then how what is it, how you teach to get to that outcome is personalized and adaptive. It's not prescriptive. That's the, that's the concept between competency-based education. Uh, in terms of examples of personalized learning, uh, we talk about the, um, the, the, adapt the adaptability of resources, empowering students, and keeping them engaged. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about each of these, and I'm hoping our slide will be available afterwards too, after the meeting. I haven't, I haven't, I don't know if anybody has confirmed that, um, but that would be a, a great way to be able to share with the limited time that we have. I want to talk about open educational resources because I think this is this is more than just a thing. It's really an approach, and in some ways, as during the last panel, I kept thinking, how do we take what we learn from there, and how do we develop it into curriculum? Because I'm really thinking about the pragmatic level and what that could look like. Uh, and so, for those of you who don't know, open educational resources—they're really about um, teaching and learning resources that are free and available to anyone, and they're published in a way that allows their distribution, it allows their adaptation, it allows the personalization. So it isn't about, we're trying to move away from this very prescriptive textbook model of education. And if we think about, again, what we just saw in the last panel, these are many ideas that we don't find in traditional textbooks. Uh, and for those of you who were here uh, the first night of the event, you know, I, in my talk there, I, I talked about how just in the United States alone, and I wish I had some international numbers, we'll get those soon, but it, just in the, in the United States alone, from the K-12 education, primary and secondary, that's an $8 billion a year market. That's not, not just a one-time investment, that's every single year. And if we multiplied it by every country of people who are here, we can see that there's actually not a scarcity of resources, there's an abundance of resources that could be reallocated in this way uh, to, to think about what OER really affords. So specifically, and I'll give a couple of examples of this uh, as well, but OER really creates the use of OER, not just the OER itself, but it creates a shift in teaching practice and with an opportunities to meet instructor, instructional goals by the vetting and curating and the modifying uh, material approaches to students, um, both their personalized student needs and their interests. But even more important than that is the fact that if I'm a teacher and I'm modifying curriculum to my students, if I share that back into the commons, into the public good, then other people can build on that. So I'm a big recycler uh, at, at home. And and so this idea of how you take or reuse what you have and pass it on for others to personalize, whether it's about new exercises or a language uh, translation, whatever it is, how do we then share that back? There's more than enough educators around the world who are doing incredible work in their classrooms. Uh, we don't need to, it, it's not a big expense to have to build all of this curriculum. We can take what we have and then we can adapt it and build on it that way. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about open educational resources, 
Uh, this has been around for a while. UNESCO actually defined the term OER back in 2002 uh, in Cape Town. Uh, the, it was an open education declaration that encouraged a set of strategies around building awareness of OER. This was in 2007, so this is 12 years ago. Uh, in 2014, there was a Paris OER declaration that provided a series of recommendations to educational stakeholders, and it really encouraged governments, so at the top level, to really create uh, policies around this. Up till then, so much of the emphasis was a very bottom-up approach, and uh, what we're seeing now, and as recently as uh, 2017, when the Second World OER Congress uh, was in Slovenia, that was sponsored by UNESCO, and it was about OER for inclusive and equitable quality education. Uh, and there were heads of ministries of education and a lot of other state leads that were really looking at this and saying this is an imperative. It's been very much tied to the Sustainable Development Goal uh, number four. For those of you who have memorized all 17, this is number four. And so there really is a, an emphasis on this now in a way worldwide that there hasn't been before. Um, just briefly, if we think about how OER supports student-centered learning, it is about equitable access. It's about uh, adapti uh, adaptability. It's about collaborative opportunities, as I mentioned, for educators to create, evaluate, share relevant and engaging learning experiences. And it's also about building and scaling the systems around continuous improvement and in innovation. Uh, my organization build, has built an open educational resource library. It's like a public digital library. It's called OER Commons. I just put this out here as an example. There's many good libraries uh, around the world. Uh, we also help other people build their libraries for other states, organizations, and for ministries of education. Uh, and in fact, um, the gentleman from Austria this morning told you about one that was in Austria. So this is just one example. Um, just an example, we, we've done a lot of uh, research also in this field of OER, uh, and this was a project that we worked with librarians. We worked with about 100 librarians and asked them how they uh, create and curate content for their teachers, and this was both at the primary, secondary, as well as the higher ed level. And you can see it really is a process uh, that goes from collaboratively identifying the curriculum needs. Again, if we picked off where the last session left off uh, and thought, what are those curriculum needs for actually teaching mindfulness and empathy and compassion? Uh, the second stage was, and this was their process that they used, um, agreeing on a curriculum framework and curation goal. So this is taking that work and putting it into action. Um, being able to search and evaluate it for use, um, building the content and then aligning it to whatever kind of standards were important you know, in that context. So that might be curriculum standards, it might be quality standards, it might be compassion standards. Uh, the whole SEL uh, movement is also looking at how to define some standards around social emotional learning and can we create content that's aligned to those standards so when you want to use this materials in a classroom, you can say, I know that these are part of that um, process. Uh, and then, of course, this is very much of a design thinking process. So you share the content, you pilot it, you refine it, and you start all over again. So this, this continuous feedback loop is a really important part, and it's been almost non-existent in education in terms of curriculum. Uh, I know many schools in the U.S. and also around the world are using textbooks that are 20 plus years old. Uh, that's some pretty uh, static curriculum over time. Uh, it's also been exciting to watch some of this OER policy be created at the government level. Um, the Commonwealth of Learning reported that 55% of the countries uh, had, had been uh, increasing their support for OER policy. Um, like I mentioned, the UNESCO Sustainability Development Goal is a huge, is a very uh, strong initiative in the education division of UNESCO. And in the U.S., uh, under a prior administration, uh, there was a, an initiative called uh, Go Open, in which we already have commitments from 20 states and 120 districts to use uh, OER. Research on uh, OER has shown us that um, for educators who are using OER, it increased the collaboration around curriculum instruction. 
and also had uh, the educators themselves uh, an increase in their own reflective practice. So almost a reprofessionalization of their work. Instead of being told, here's what you teach on Thursday, here's what you test on Friday, what does it mean to actually put the, the concept of curriculum back into those experts who really understand their classrooms and their classroom needs better than anybody? For learners, uh, we've looked at how the use of OER has increased student uh, interest in their subject, um, satisfaction with the learning experience. Not surprisingly, when you see this, we often have students, both at the K-12 and the higher ed level, working with faculty uh, to create new curriculum. So maybe the, the faculty member will, will first present it that year, and by the end of that semester, students have themselves recommended how to improve the curriculum. So this is, again, very student-centered. Uh, uh, and not to mention that OER really supports students as self-directed learners as well, because this kind of content is available. Uh, there's, a, there's a big move towards something with commercial publishers uh, around digital, which is maybe you get your digital content on, a, on some tablet, but it's only available for that amount of time of the semester and then it's gone. So they say that this is free, uh, you know, freely available because it's on the tablet that you've already bought for the student, but in fact that really doesn't have, um, it doesn't have the spirit of open because it doesn't allow you to take that, to remix it, to distribute it, not to mention to have it over time.